I've repented many times in my life. You probably have too. I'll tell you about one of those times, the bare bones of the story at least. Now you may be afraid that I'm about to confess my sins to you when I tell you about my repentance story, but fear not. It might be entertaining to hear some juicy details about my failings, but most likely you would find that my sins are the sadly ordinary sort of ways that we all fall short, the ways that we can be selfish, heedless of the effects of our words on others, the ways that I've lived fearfully instead of open-heartedly and boldly, and on and on. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, including me, we all have moral failures. We all have missed the mark in regard to love of God and love of our neighbor. Thanks be to God, we're loved anyway. And because God loves us so much, God calls on us to repent, to change, to stop living in ways that are dead and instead to bear fruit. And as we learn from Jesus today, repentance is urgent. Don't put it off. You don't know how much time you have. Repentance is not only something we do in response to recognition of our sin. Repentance actually has a bigger meaning. It means to change our path. The Greek word we translate as repent is metanoia, which means a transformative change of heart. We repent when we stop living our, in our lives in a way that we've come to understand causes harm to God, our neighbors, or ourselves. We also repent when we recognize that the way we're living is not bearing fruit, when we're not becoming all that God calls us to be. I invite you today to think about the parable of Jesus we heard today in that latter sense. He was calling his listeners to repent because their way of life was not bearing fruit. God wants us to bear fruit in our lives, just like the landowner wanted his tree to bear fruit. And, God, and the parable suggests that God doesn't want us to wait to make the changes we need in order to bear that fruit. Time is of the essence. There's that famous line of poetry that Mary Oliver wrote, challenges us, tell me what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? None of us know how long we have, so get busy bearing fruit now. And if you need to make a transformative change in order to do so, repent. We only have one wild and precious life. So if you need to add some fertilizer to yours to get, help you bear fruit, then get busy and start stirring up some compost. I'll tell you about an example of repentance from my own life, not because I'm especially virtuous and I want you to admire me, but instead to help remind you of those times you have repented in your life, or maybe even to encourage you to repent now. I decided when I was 12 years old to be a clinical psychologist based primarily on my viewing of the Bob Newhart show on TV. <laughs> Bob was a clinical psychologist with a beautiful office in the Chicago Loop, and I admired the healing and hope his listening seemed to bring to troubled souls. Plus, he was kind of funny. I sensed that I had some qualities that would make me good at bringing healing and hope to troubled souls as well. Plus, I would love to have a nice office like Bob had. So I subscribed to Psychology Today to try to learn more about the field and I relentlessly pursued my goal, majoring in psychology in college and going straight into a clinical psychology PhD program after I graduated. Unfortunately, I began to realize in my first year of graduate school that I didn't really want the life I was pursuing. 
but I have a deeply ingrained reluctance to quit things that I start. So I doggedly continued my program, eventually earning my PhD. And I was pretty good at practicing as a psychologist, but I didn't love it. There are a lot of twists and turns to my story, a lot of pain and suffering. But the fact that I've been standing in this pulpit for almost 15 years should tell you that at some point I repented, bringing all that I had learned in my psychology training to help inform my work as an ordained minister of the gospel. There was a lot of good compost in that uh, psychology training that helped to fertilize the soil for my new calling. Nothing about that time was wasted. In the passage of scripture we heard today, those listening to Jesus ask him to react to some untimely and tragic deaths. The veil of history is such that we don't know the details of the events in question, but presumably these deaths were well known at that time. A common theological presumption then, and to be honest now, is that when bad things happen, it must be because the people deserved it in some way that they were especially awful sinners. But Jesus rejects that simplistic notion. As we see again and again in the world and in our own lives, bad things happen to all kinds of people, the virtuous and the suspect alike. That is especially the case in situations in which political power is being used for corrupt purposes. We see that, for example, in Ukraine, right now, the suffering of the innocent. But also, there are many examples from Jesus's time, the time of the first century in Galilee and Judea, in which innocent people suffered because of political power. Innocent people die tragically, not because of their sin, but because the world is not yet as God is calling it to be. Jesus' response to these tragic deaths is both to reject the easy explanation that they were terrible sinners, but also to remind his listeners that our lives can end unexpectedly and tragically. Because we don't know how much time we have, it's urgent that we repent immediately so that we can bear fruit. Time's a wasting, Jesus says. So get busy living fully into your one wild and precious life. Jesus is not suggesting that repentance will prevent us from catastrophe. Rather, he's stating that changing our minds, changing our hearts, will help us to produce good fruit no matter what challenges life throws our way. Now, I'll be honest. This call to repentance makes me squirm. It makes me wonder whether I need to make big changes. Have I become complacent, too comfortable with my life as it is? Is Jesus asking me to quit my job, sell everything, give it to the poor, and live a peripatetic existence? Maybe, but I don't think so. The parable would suggest something a little less radical. He invites us to consider whether our lives are barren or bearing, or instead bearing fruit. A landowner has planted a fig tree, and long past the time that it should be fruiting, it's still barren. We don't know why, but the landowner is fed up and tells the gardener to cut it down. That would be like me giving up everything in my life and starting over again completely. But the gardener suggests a different approach in the parable. The gardener suggests giving it some time and adding some compost to the tree. The long journey that took me from psychology to ministry was like cutting a tree down and planting a new one. I haven't shared all the details about why it was so difficult, but trust me, it was a major change. So much had become dead in my life that it was time for metanoia, a transformative change of heart. It was a hard and painful process, but also joyful because I knew I was called to make the change. I didn't know how it would end up, but I knew I needed to engage 
in something different in order to bear fruit. I had to let go of so much of what was comfortable and familiar and trust that God was working in and through me and all of those around me to turn all that I had discarded into nutrient-rich mulch for my soul. But much more of my life has been like the parable of the fig tree, times when my life was not bearing fruit as it should, and all it took was a little tender loving care, little digging into the soil of my gifts and the compost of the nurturing of the community all around me to help it bear fruit again. Repentance is necessary in both scenarios, both the dramatic change scenarios, but also just the we need to make some few, few changes here. It takes discernment and wisdom to know what sort of change is necessary. For most of us, most of the time, we just need some nurturing by a good gardener, by the one who knows us and loves us, just wants desperately for us to bear fruit in only the way each of us can. In her book, The Way of Repentance, Irma Zaleski says this about the journey toward bearing fruit. And I quote, Repentance, conversion of the heart, does not mean being filled and tormented by guilt. Instead, it means being ready to admit our responsibility for our actions and our need for forgiveness and having a firm desire to change our life, to turn away from ourselves in prayer and in love. Repentance means, above all, a constant, patient growing in love. It means our willingness to open ourselves to the work of the Spirit in us and to embrace fully the gift of salvation. You may think that a call to repentance is a call to feel guilty, but Irma Zaleski and Jesus, for that matter, remind us that repentance is a call toward growth, a call toward love for ourselves and those around us. It is a call to bear the fruit that God has created and nurtured us to bear. In this Lenten season, in this Lenten journey, I invite you to ponder how God is calling you to repent, to nurture the soil of your life so that you bear more fruit. Time's a wasting. You have only one wild and precious life. What are you going to do with it?